we have a, a theory which is called quantum electrodynamics, which is our pride and joy. It's so successful and it's such so wide in its application. And what I would like to tell you about is that theory, how it works, or how it looks like it works, and what the world looks like from that point of view. The uh, physics has got a history, at least a theoretical history, of uh, synthesis perpetually. Of course, the experiment is always finding new phenomena. The problem is to work them together, and sometimes we see that they're different aspects of the same phenomenon. An example is, of course, the simplest and earliest one is that the laws of motion became, in the theory, explained the properties of heat, because heat was motion, and if you knew how motion worked, you could understand the thermal, thermal properties. It also explained the properties of sound, which is otherwise a mystery, as the motion of the atoms and waves and the gas. Aside from that, uh, knowing the laws of motion, you had to know Newton, who gave us the laws of, worked out the laws of motion, also gave us another theory about the forces between large masses and distances from one another called the theory of gravity. So that's just uh, that thing, the theory of gravity, is not is well known and understood pretty well, but is not what I'm going to talk about. As the time went on, phenomena associated with electricity, you know, rubbing combs in your hair and things like that, and magnetism became uh, interesting to the experimental physicists, and they discovered the relations between them experimentally until they saw, ultimately, that it would not two different phenomena, but different aspects of the, of the same thing. Another phenomenon that Newton had studied was light. So without time, it looked at first like there were many things, motion and gravity, electricity and magnetism later, and light. But when uh, Maxwell put together the laws of electricity and magnetism, he found out that the behavior that the equations that he had produced expectation that would be behavior of waves that would propagate at a speed which was figured out from electrical measurements, but came out the same as the speed that light actually propagated. And so there was a new theory of light, which is that it was an electromagnetic wave. And Maxwell's great synthesis in 1873 was to connect electricity, magnetism, and light. Light is just one aspect of the electromagnetic wave, which can have different kinds of wavelengths from that point of view. And if you have different wavelengths, if the wavelength is very short between about four a hundred millionths of a meter, no, of a centimeter, 400 millionths of a centimeter and 700 millionths of a centimeter, then you see it directly with the eye. But if it gets longer, the wave is, well, it's a long end, it's red, and then the other end, it's blue. And if it gets more longer than the red, we call it infrared, the rays are there, but the eye doesn't seem, the pit viper has an eye that sees the infrared. And if you go in the other direction to the ultra, Beyond the violet, then we can't see it again, but the bee has an eye that sees the ultraviolet. And uh, if we go still further to the far ultraviolet, no animal has it that can see it, but we can make instruments that are detected or photographic plates and so on, up into x-rays and so forth. And down in the other direction, far infrared, uh, you get into radio waves, and we can build instruments that detect them, and we can use them to advertise soap. <laughs> in it. In addition, so that, that is an enormous range of one property, the wavelength. A range of phenomena that's a complete enormous spectrum. The spectrum we see with the eye is a very narrow range, and it's an entire spectrum. It's all put together with the one theory of electromagnetic waves. I'm going to talk about that part of it, that I'm going to call it light, instead of saying electromagnetic radiation. Light is what we see, is only one little part. But from the physicist's point of view, the accident that the human eye happens to be sensitive to waves from here to here is not essential. The phenomena are the same you know, over the whole range. And uh, we call, I'm going to call them all light. But it could be radio waves or x-rays or what have you. Next thing that was discovered was the structure of the atoms. And that, um, I'd like to remind you that you have, I believe, a Nobel Prize winner from New Zealand before, Mr. Rutherford, who was, I believe, a New Zealander, who worked out that the atoms had nuclei. You know, seem always here, I've only been here a few days, so everybody's talking themselves down. I thought this would be a happy country, but something's happened to you. 
We've got plenty of room and not too many people, and it looks like it ought to be good. Anyway, you do. Don't forget you had Rutherford, so it's okay. <laughs> Anyhow, he had a theory of the... He developed the, our understanding of the atoms as having a tiny core, as very heavy, with the particles going around it, electrons. Now, supposing that the electrons went around according to the laws of motion of Newton, some properties of matter could be understood supposing the atoms were made that way. But most of the time, it failed. And it became more and more of a crisis in physics to understand what matter was like, uh, because it looked so obviously right that it had to be electrons going around nuclei, and yet nothing worked when you worked it out. And the discovery was made then in the discovery of quantum mechanics, first in the behavior of light and then in the behavior of matter, and finally culminating in 1926 with the full equation of quantum mechanics, which told us that the laws of motion of Newton were not right and had to be modified to other laws, which are quantum laws of motion. And when this uh, quantum laws of motion were applied to electrons to explain the properties of matter, it was a fantastic success. The properties of the atoms can be all worked out mathematically, in principle at least, and the simple atoms in detail. And therefore, the theory behind chemistry, which atoms combine with which, at what rate, and so forth, is in principle. Theoretical chemistry deeply is physics. <laughs> it's not a joke. It's a direct, the chemist will admit that's exactly his point of view, that the understanding of the atoms in the deepest level is physical, physics, except that the atoms have so many particles in them, it's very hard to calculate what's going to happen. So he has to use a lot of empirical rules to help him. But in, as far as we can tell, there's nothing about chemistry that's not understood, ultimately, as the behavior of electrons following the laws of motion of quantum mechanics. This defines the properties of all substances also, and so that the whole theory of the properties of ordinary substances and the chemical properties and so forth have all been reduced to the motion of electrons. In the meantime, the theory of light and its interaction with matter, which was Maxwell's equations, had to be modified to become a quantum theory also. Oh, I forgot to mention that during this time, uh, one, to somewhat to one side of the way I want to go in these lectures, I would, I'm not going to discuss much about relativity, but the theory of relativity was developed, and that just makes it easier for us to guess laws. It tells us if we know how something varies in space, then we know how it varies in time, or vice versa that there's a nice relationship between the behavior in space and behavior in time, and that it's all sort of different aspects of the same geometrical thing called space-time. At any rate, Dirac, using the principles of relativity and, new quantum, and the new quantum mechanics, found a wonderful theory, the simplest possible thing you could write down for the motion of electrons, uh, Dirac's theory of electrons, and uh, that was the situation in about 1927 or 8. But uh, the problem of the interaction of electrons with light, which was a complete quantum theory of electrodynamics, in other words, make Maxwell's equations of the light, of electricity and magnetism, and the theory of motion of electrons, all into one grand theory, was accomplished in 1929 in the theory was, that was called quantum electrodynamics. The trouble with it was nobody could figure anything out, or better. When they did figure it out, they got nutty answers. If you didn't do it too carefully, you got a reasonably good answer for a problem. But if you carried it out very carefully, you would get some silly answer like zero or infinity or absolutely absurd results. This strikingly lasted for 20 years while people tried to figure out what the correct theory was. During this time, experimenters were measuring things more and more accurately. The theory of uh, the one of, they measured, uh, they found a few things with very subtle effects that the theory of interaction of light with electricity should explain. And then they measured them, and they found these effects. But they couldn't explain that as a theory didn't explain it quantitatively, because when the people made the calculation, they got infinity instead of the right result. As an example, a, an electron in a magnetic field precesses at a certain rate. And the rate, according to Dirac, was a certain amount. But when you, he didn't take into account the interaction of electricity and light, and when he took it into account, we knew that the answer should be wrong. Let's say that Dirac's answer was right, but when experiment was made, it came out not to be one, but to be a little bit more. Uh, this number here, the experimenters weren't good enough to tell us exactly. It's somewhere between 5 and 21 here. We write it as 8, plus or minus 
three as the next digit. That means this is not measured accurately. So in 19, uh, I'm sorry, by 1948, 20 years, we had at last measured something which showed that the original theory was without interaction, is incomplete. This is supposed to be the result of interaction. When you went to calculate it, you got infinity. So there was a very strong effort made then in 1948 because of the fact that experiments were showing such accuracy to try finally to get that theory straightened out. And it turned out, surprisingly, it was worked out more or less independently by three guys who got Nobel Prizes, of one of which you see here. And uh, uh, Professor Swinger, that's not me, but the other <laughs> one of the other ones, first worked out a correct way. We, we found out that the original theory that was written in 1929 by Heisenberg and Dirac and Pauli was very nearly correct. And the problem was that there was something wrong with the way they handled uh, doing the calculations, and we straightened it out. And then we could do calculations. And Schwinger, for example, calculated this and found out that it was something like this, theoretically. And that was a tremendous achievement. It's a great excitement. Because that meant we really understood some more, some more subtle details, and that the original theory of Heisenberg and Dirac and so on were fundamentally, was fundamentally right, just a little switch on how you calculated things. Now this is the theory, then, that we're going to talk about. This theory has lasted now for 50 years. Uh, 30, 50 years, 30 years. <laughs> I can't add, from 1979, 1949. Oh, it's 50 years, yes, from the time that Dirac and, and Heisenberg wrote it, and it took 20 years to figure out how to calculate with it. Then the remaining 30 years, the methods of calculations improved, they calculated things much more accurately, and the experimenters became more and more adept at measuring things. And this particular rate that they uh, measured in 1948 to here, now in 1979, has been measured to be, in fact, 100. 1159-6524, and the 4 may not be 4. It could be <laughs> somewhere between 2 and 6. After all, the more you write, the, somewhere you have to stop, right? And this, I write to show you the tremendous achievement of experimenters during the last 30 years in order to test with the precision the correctness of the theory. In the meantime, poor guys using calculators and sweating and writing marks on pieces of paper. So I'm calculating the results of the theory under the same circumstances for the same phenomena produce the predicted value that it should be 6523 within minus, plus or minus 3. Why should the theories have a plus or minus? Well, they get exhausted in computing <laughs> the number of decimal places that they need to to keep up with experiments. There are, this is not atypical. There are two or three or four, perhaps, uh, different places where it's been measured and checked to that degree of accuracy. This degree of accuracy, that number of decimal places, corresponds to a precision something like this. If you were measuring the distance to, of me to the moon, the question would come up, do you mean from my chin or from the top of my head? <laughs> the difference between whether it's from the chin or the top of my head to the moon is the plus and minus two on the end of that number in proportion, all right? That is uh, to intimidate you that the theory is correct uh, in high accuracy. I have, don't need to produce a large number of other experimental results. They all have this feature. It is remarkable that at this time it is possible to say that there's no experimental discrepancy known between the predictions of the theory anywhere and the uh, results of experiments. That doesn't mean we can compute everything. The rules of the game by which we make the computation, the laws underneath everything that makes nature work, are simple. It doesn't mean we can really figure everything out. To give an example, if you play the game of checkers, I think you call it checkers here, maybe draughts, something. <laughs> the rules of the game are very simple. The way the pieces move is simple. And if you want to make it even simple and make the rule no kings, but when you come to the end of the board, you start at the beginning. It doesn't make any difference. The rules are simple. But imagine a checkerboard with 100 million piece squares on each side. Now, hundreds of millions of these checkers in different positions moving through the board, taking pieces and being taken from the other piece. Which way are they going to swirl? Which way is the game going to go? That takes a lot of thinking. It isn't the typical. 
difficulty of the rules that's involved, but the multiplicity of its action and interconnection. In matter, as you all know, be made, is made out of atoms and all this stuff, is such a multitude of little particles that in ordinary circumstances, so much is happening that in spite of the fact that the rules are relatively simple, not quite as easy as the checker rules, but pretty easy, it still is very difficult in almost all circumstances to figure out what could happen exactly. Well, when we can't figure it out exactly, but can do a pretty good job of approximating, the phenomenon is in the range that we expect. When we have a situation that's sufficiently simple, a corner of the board where there's only a few pieces, then we can compute exactly what ought to happen, and when we do experiments in those circumstances, it fits exactly. And that's all we can say at the moment about this theory. This uh, theory has been designed, was originally designed in the ideas of space and time and a geometrical framework. And the question is, how small a scale can we go down to? And during the time of this, this period of time, we not only measure, tried to measure accuracy, but also tried to see how small a distance the theory would be correct at. And I can only tell you that distance is 10 to the minus 15 centimeters. That means point zero, 15 zeros before you get to 14 zeros, before you get to a first digit of distance in centimeters. We, that thing is that accurate. We know that the laws are that accurate. To put it another way, it used to be thought that atoms were small. Oh, that was a limit of measurement. But uh, at the present time, with the new instruments and design during all this time, we've been able to make instruments that can test this theory down to distances that could be described this way. If the atom is made 100 kilometers on a side, then we're measuring with one centimeter accuracy inside. So the theory is right to distances corresponding to a centimeter when an atom is 100 kilometers. So altogether, I can only emphasize with delight and excitement the fact that so much of nature is so accurately describable by one theory. There's an enormous range of phenomena. All the things you ordinarily see, the best way to describe what the phenomena are, colors of things, this softness of materials, the weight of things, the way their temperature, when you change the temperature, how much heat it takes, and sounds, and a whole of these phenomena. The only best way to describe it is to describe the phenomena that are not included in this theory. And one of them is the accelerations produced by gravity. The force of gravity is in another theory, gravitational theory, or general relativity. Another range of phenomena have to do with exciting the interior of nuclei, uh, nuclear physics, uh, protons and neutrons, radioactivity, and nuclear phenomena. That excluded all the rest of the phenomena of nature are contained in this one theory. Now you can see why it is that I feel a bit uncomfortable when someone asks to give a talk, please tell us the latest things, because then I'm talking about our problems that we have in trying to understand the insides of a proton. For example, for a proton, to tell you a contrast, our understanding, of the outside of the atom, the electrons and light that I'm going to talk about, the theory is our jewel and pr great achievement to the things that people ordinarily have to talk about at these lectures, it's as follows. You take the corresponding number for a proton. I don't remember it. It starts at 273, I think, 19. I'm not sure. Or is it 2719? I don't remember. And it goes on for a number of decimal places because the experiment that can measure it so well. Now we have a theory of the protons recently developed involving quarks and so on. We can't make any calculations yet. We haven't developed the technique good enough. So the best I could say, really, and probably exaggerating, is that the theory does say that this number should be around three and the error, and that's what I think I must be bigger. I can't prove that it's as small as it might be 0.3. Uh, that gives an idea of how sloppy our understanding of protons is compared to that dual precision that we understand electrons, all right? So that gives us some idea of why it is I feel so uncomfortable talking all the time about what we don't know much about, and nobody asks me about the stuff we do know everything about. So, Therefore, I'm forcing upon you a lecture on the things that we think we know something about. Okay, so that's our job. Now the question is, what am I going to do? I'm going to tell you what the theory is. I'm going to tell you what it looks like, what we do to make the calculation, just what the thing is, because otherwise, how are you going to understand what world picture, in other words, 
this thing is. And it is a world picture because it describes all the phenomena, except for radioactivity and gravity, in the world. <laughs> That's a lot of phenomena. It's possible even it might explain and should explain, if everything is thoroughly understood, the laughter of the audience when you make a dumb remark. Now, if I'm going to explain this theory, the question is, are you going to understand it? Will you understand uh, the theory? When I tell you first that the first time we really thoroughly explain it to our own physics students is when they're in the third year graduate, in graduate physics, then you think the answer is going to be no. And that's correct. You will not understand. <laughs> but this business about not understanding is a very serious one that we have between the scientists and an audience. And I want to be at work with you, which I want to tell you something. The students do not understand it either. <laughs> and that's because the professor doesn't understand it. <laughs> which is not a joke, but a very interesting, I think. And I would like to explain it. My task, really, as a to explain all this is to convince you not to turn away because it appears incomprehensible. That's what it takes four years of us to do to the student, is to get him so he doesn't run away because it looks crazy. The thing that's exciting about this is that nature is strange as it can be in this sense, that the rules that are going to be obeyed, that I'm going to tell you about, by which this stuff is analyzed, by which we understand nature. The rules of the checkers, yeah, are so screwy, you can't believe them. <laughs> Nevertheless, if you follow out the consequences and see what they do, sure enough, all the ordinary phenomena that happen, you can understand. That's hard to do, because you have to know how to count big numbers and do lots of arithmetic and so forth to see how it is that these rules really explain common experience. That will be more difficult for you to understand. What is not difficult is this. Well, that's difficult enough, yes, because it's so strange. But it's no more difficult for you than for the students, and no less difficult. I know sometimes I hear people coming to my lectures to say, oh, I'm going to come to your lecture, although I know I'm not going to understand anything. It makes me feel bad. Or when they come up afterwards, they say, oh, I enjoyed your lecture. It was lots of fun, but I didn't understand anything you said. <laughs> I really am trying to make myself clear, so I would like to discuss this with you. Will you please keep coming in spite of the fact that you don't understand it? Because I don't understand it either. And the fun of it is that we, it's so mysterious, okay? That's the fun of it. So this business about understanding requires just a few words. And so I'm going to say something about the relationship, and I would hope we get some of your cooperation. Sometimes you don't understand because, say, the language is, the fellow comes from America and he talks too fast. That's my fault and I apologize. Uh, I hope it's all right. That's a kind of trivial difficulty, relatively. Next kind of not understanding is because you perhaps use new words. That's an accident that comes because I'm working technically and I use the words all day, every day and I forget that everybody doesn't know what they mean and I have to be very careful. Again, my job. And then there's a kind of saying that you don't understand it, meaning I don't believe it, it's too crazy, it's the kind of thing I just, I'm not going to accept it. Uh, well, the other possible, well, this kind, I hope you'll come along with me. I, you'll have to accept it. Because it's the way nature works. If you want to know the way nature works, we looked at it carefully, look at it, that's the way it looks. You don't like it, go somewhere else. <laughs> to another universe where the rules are simpler. <laughs> Philosophically more pleasing, more psychologically easy. I can't help it, okay? If I'm going to tell you honestly what the world looks like to, to, the, to human beings who have struggled as hard as they can to understand it, I can only tell you what it looks like and I cannot make it any simple. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to simplify it. Eh? I'm not going to fake it. I'm not going to make tell you it's something like a ball bearing on a spring. It isn't. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you what it really is like, and if you don't like it, that's too bad, okay? There's also the possibility that you don't understand because you're con 
you get a bit confused and you're sure that you must have misinterpreted what I said or uh, something like that and you get turned off and that's of course a difficulty. Let me assure you that most of the time you did interpret correctly what I said because if it does, I'm gonna, it's going to be so shocking the way nature actually works that you're not going to believe that either. I faked it. I'm not telling you the full story that for the students I have another way of explaining it or something like that. It is not true. I'm going to be honest. Okay? So I'm going to ask you to try not to get turned off and not to be afraid. Relax and enjoy it. Realize that nobody understands it. <laughs> now what the hell are my students learning for four years if nobody <laughs> understands it? I'm going to explain. And I'm going to explain by a kind of an example. Uh, I like to, to take the Mayan Indians. They had a writing system, and we know some of the things they wrote were astronomical things. And they had a scheme for predicting th many things in the sky, eclipses and so on. And let's take the example of when Venus, which was important to them because it represented evil of some sort, was a morning star and when it was an evening star. So they could predict ahead of time whether this bad influence was going to be in the morning or in the evening. And so they discovered that if they waited, that this cycle of morning, evening, morning, evening, morning, evening, five of those occupied just exactly the same time as eight times a certain period that was important to them, 365 days. It's not exactly a year, and they knew the difference, but they still counted in 365-day intervals, which they called a tune. So they said that five of these cycles is eight tunes. Then they uh, discovered, of course, very quickly, that if they did this five-cycle bit for eight tunes ten times, they were off by about six days. And so they had a rule for shifting, the, making corrections as they went along, and thus had a very good way to predict when Venus was coming up. Okay. Now let's uh, look at this thing from a point of view. Suppose that the professors, the priests in those days, who wrote this stuff and taught their students these rules, were giving a lecture to try to explain what they did in order to make these wonderful predictions about Venus. Then, if the fellow was any good at exposition and really knew what he was doing, he would say, what we're doing is we're counting the day, just like you're putting nuts in a pot. And we keep on counting, uh, 365 nuts and then another 365 and another 365 and another 365. Guys, what a lot of work. And when we get all finished, we say that's five of these periods. Now they understood what he said. That's easy. They did not know a quick and tricky way to add 365 times eight. I'm sorry, I said five times. I meant eight times. Uh, the students were learning in the meantime the laws of arithmetic, something which is to us now, because we have public and edu uh, general education, almost everybody has to struggle through and learn how to add numbers by a tricky scheme of writing them in place system and making carryings and so on, so that a, if you buy wine for $4.15 and your meal is $2.87 or vice versa, it costs $7.02. And the girl who does this, the waitress, just an ordinary person in two minutes does that. How did she do it? What is she doing when she's adding 415 to 287? She's doing this, counting out 415 pennies, then counting out 287 more pennies and telling you how many pennies you would have got if you counted them all from the beginning to the end. But it's a highly educated and very trained to be able to do that with those large numbers quickly. This training is, is something, in spite of the fact that everybody's got it, it's something pretty good because in the 14th century, mathematicians, were, they were called, who could do that. Almost everybody in our civilization can do that, but I, would, I took this example, you can understand what's involved. What the students are taught, you see, in our particular problems now about physics, there are many bigger numbers. The numbers are much bigger. It's hard to, the numbers are so enormous you can't count them directly. And so we've invented a fantastic array of tricks and gimmicks for putting together the numbers, adding, counting, checking, and so forth, without actually doing it 
the way I could describe what we're trying to do. If I say, I draw this and I draw that and I draw this and I draw that and I see where the end point is, we don't actually sit down and draw 7,000 arrows and find out where the end point, we have a way of figuring out where it comes, just like we don't actually count 415 pennies and 287 pennies to find out that you owe me 702 pennies. We do it by another trick. This are the tricks of mathematics, and that's all. So that's the part I'm not going to worry about. We're not going to worry about that. So don't relax. You don't have to know mathematics. All you have to know is what it is. All it is is tricky ways of doing something, which would be laborious otherwise. <laughs> so what the, it's true that in the years we have developed enormous abilities in mathematics, and it takes a long time to train the students, and so therefore they're very highly educated in that. But if you ask them why, now we go back to the Mayans, we ask them why, why, when you wait, for, fill up a tub eight times with 365 day markers, it comes out that the Venus is up five times. They don't know. They don't understand it at all. The more accurately they can do it, fact that they know that they have to change it by six days and so forth adds nothing to their understanding of it. The student who has learned all this mathematics and is able to make these calculations not only of Venus of the Mars, or the Sun, or the, the eclipses and everything else is a super priest, doesn't know why any better. I and mean, he would explain it's nothing but counting days, he would be reduced to the truth on the one hand and to an honest statement that he doesn't understand it. On the other hand, and could tell somebody all about it who doesn't know how to count all these numbers so trickily and so cleverly, as this priest students knew. Okay. Now, probably, I don't know about philosophy of Mayas. We have very little information due to the efficiency of the Spanish conquistadores and, uh, well, mostly their priests who burned all the books. They had hundreds of thousands of books, and there's three left. And one of them has this penis calculation. So that's how we know about that. And uh, just imagine our civilization reduced to three books, the particular ones left by accident, which ones, see? Eh? So uh, anyway, I get off the subject. If I make this up now, that what I'm saying now is just a story. Suppose now that the students would discuss, or people would discuss the possible meanings of this. Why? And then we begin to think about, well, 8 times 365 is 2920. That's got two twos in it. Now, two is a lucky number, and it has two twos in it. <laughs> and then the nine represents the god of so-and-so, which is related to Venus, and so forth. And that would be a good argument. Then, but in another city, some other guys getting together have a different kind of an argument about it. They say, look, now, the fact that there's a 20 at the end, if I subtracted that away first, I get 2900, which is especially a good number from blah, 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 and so on. And they would have different theories. And then someone would come along and say, you know, it doesn't make any difference which one of these theories is right. We still have this fact to go along with. And that is our modern scientific point of view. In the earliest days of science, we got confused arguing philosophically what was a reasonable reason for nature of hoard of vacuum. Or it seemed to be nice that well, gods were doing it. There are different kinds of psychological reasons for thinking it probably is all right after you discovered what it was. These things were never useful for predicting what should happen next, and we soon learned not to make these arguments. It's useless. It doesn't add anything. And so we're not going to make my imaginary Mayan uh, arguments about the various gods that make the numbers. And so I'm left, if I'm a modern scientist, with a description of the situation. All right? Now I prepared the audience. Used up all my time to prepare the audience. Doesn't make any difference. I will continue anyway, in spite of the fact I used up all the time to uh, describe the theory. And in describing it, I will first describe some part of it. The theory is the properties of light, electrons, and the interaction of light and electrons. It's all one theory. I cut it into three parts that way. And the first thing I'm going to start with is the uh, properties of light. OK? And I'm going to tell you some of the properties of light, and I hope, if I can do it, to get to the key point, and then uh, we'll continue in the following lectures to elaborate on it. First, uh, I don't go through the history of the theory of light. It had various 
things. The first and most important thing I would say is that Newton found out that what we see as white light is a mixture of otherwise purer stuff that's easy to understand. And if you understand how each of the parts works, you just put the mixture back together again. And then you separate the light in the prism, which is done automatically in Auckland, very often, as far as I can tell, in rainbows. <laughs> and uh, the various colored, if you would separate light in the prism and take out the part that looked, say, yellow, then you couldn't separate that any further in another prism. It just stayed yellow and orange. That's called monochromatic light, light of one color. So I'm going to discuss all my phenomena for a while with light of one color because it's simpler. The first thing, Newton believed that light was a corpuscular thing and had very, turned out to have very strange properties from that point of view. And it was then explained that many of these strange properties was because, in fact, it was a wave which was wrong. It turned out he was right. It was a particle. It is corpuscular. Uh, the reason that he said it was corpuscular was based on an incorrect guess as to the behavior of waves. And his argument was wrong, logically. But it turned out in the end that it was uh, particles. Now, how I talk about how I know it's particles is this. If we make an instrument to detect light that's as sensitive as it can possibly be made, we make it more and more sensitive. In fact, uh, this thing is called a photomultiplier. And uh, that's not the only instrument. I just take one for an example. It doesn't make any difference how we do it. When we get to light that's sufficiently weak, an instrument to detect it hears clicks, uh, pulses, uh, as if it was rain falling on a something. You can bang, 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 bang. When the light is bright, the rain goes bang, 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 bang. A lot of them. When the light is very dim, boom, 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 boom. Small. The particular boom, booms, and the bang, bang, bangs, and so forth are completely out of proportion. The actual rate is enormous, okay, and a little bit less when there's less light. It's very difficult to get it to a boom, boom, boom. You could so dark in here you wouldn't know what. <laughs> but. Uh, this device, to show you an example of how it works, just so you understand, what happens when we detect the weakest possible light is it works like this. There's a metal plate here, maybe cesium or something. When light shines on it, it knocks an electron out. Then you have another plate here with a voltage that attracts the electron, so the electron, so to speak, falls. It's attracted and speeds up and hits this plate. When it hits this plate, it's got about 100 volts of energy, it Flatters. Other electrons get knocked out of the two or three, five, perhaps, on the average. Now, those are attracted to another plate. And they all go sailing down here with another 100 volts, five of them this time. And each one of those knocks out, on the average, five or six other electrons. Now I got 25, yeah. And that's attracted to another plate. And that hits those and so on. And you have a maybe 10 or a dozen plates. By the time you get out the other end, you've got such a chunk of charge and electrons, so many of them, you multiply 5 times 5 times 5 times 5, you'd be a long time counting pins to discover how much that is. You get such a tremendous pulse that you can, the number of electrons high enough, it can go directly through circuits and so forth and turn on and off switches and do all kinds of things, and make voltages to pin, make noises, do all these things. It's amplified. Now, what happens when we have a device like this and we put it in the dark is it goes click, 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 click. Every once in a while, a light particle comes in, a photon. This is a particle in every sense. The experiments have all the right properties as follows. That if you have a very weak light, and you have one or two, or just one of them every once in a while, if you put two cells out, and there's just a few of them coming, then it goes on one or the other. They don't go off together. They go off together, you've got too many coming, and you can't resolve it. But if it's very weak, the particle is either here or there. And it comes in particle. I don't know how I can much I can emphasize this, especially to young students who have learned its ways. It is particles in every way whenever you can detect it. It's unfortunate for us that we can see the light. I mean, it's unfortunate for us. No, not quite, not quite. <laughs> that we, if we were 10 times more sensitive to light, then in the dark, we would see that what we're seeing is little flashes, little tiny dips, dots of light. The nerve would go off just like the photomultiplier, in spots. But the human eye is not quite that sensitive and takes five or six of these particles, photons, five or six photons, to make one nerve fiber go off. So, it isn't, so we cannot detect with the eye 
light quite low enough to notice the fact that it comes in the form of raindrops. All right? Got that? They're particles, right? And you can detect them with an instrument. You can count them, so and so many per second. Bright light, more per second. Dim light, less per second. Okay? Now we start to describe the properties of light a little further. The next property I want to talk about is reflection uh, from a glass surface or a water surface. I believe everybody knows that you can see the sun or the moon, let's say, in the sea as it settles. Of course, you know. <laughs> Reflections are a happy thing in art pictures. The moon's light reflected from the water. You have a, a window. Uh, when you look through a window, you, there must be millions of examples. Right back there, there is one. You look at a window, you can see through it, but also some reflection. Now, already there's a problem. Because the light that's reflected is not as intense as the light that's shining. Some of the light goes through the window, say, or through the water down in. Only some of the light comes back. If the light is headed for water, for example, straight down, only about 2% reflects. What does that mean, only 2% reflects? That means that if we had a photon counter here, let's say, uh, draw the experiment so you know what I'm talking about. It's hard to make a water surface that's vertical. Yes, so we'll make the water surface horizontal. <laughs> and uh, light's coming down, and some of it's reflected, and we put a counter here to see one of those photomultiplier things, and we count the count. And we know how much we should have got, and we find what? How can it be partly reflected? When, I forgot to say when I was talking about the particles, when you have light of a definite color, the energy that the first one knocks out is always the same. Each particle is the same strength. There's not half particles. It's a full photon. What you get is a full photon. Which you only, if the light is dimmer, what does that mean? There are fewer of them, right? Simple. So, of a hundred that come down here, perhaps uh, four, now, this way in 96 go through. What determines which four? How does it, which one that's coming down of the hundred who knows what to come back up? <laughs> All right? So the situation is that the phenomena is probabilistic. It takes odds. It comes down here and uh, has a 4% chance. That one out of 25 trials. Huh? I think you know what odds are. If you have, for instance, a die and you want to get a a one and you roll it, well, it doesn't come out so often, but it comes out sometimes, one out of six. And uh, what that means, if you roll die a hundred times, let's make it 600 times, it'll be easy. You roll a die 600 times, you might get 105 ones, or maybe 92 ones, or something like that, right? You get about a hundred. And, in this, and if the numbers were bigger, the accuracy in percentage is bigger, not accurate. Uh, so if you have billion, uh, six billion, no, not six, because I got one twenty-five. Twenty-five billion of these coming down, about a billion will come off. Okay? Now, the, let's see if the, the next feature is how can it be probabilistic? Suppose that I had a light so weak that I had only one photon coming every few minutes. Will this counter go off or will the one down here go off? One out of twenty-five times this one goes off. Which time? What determines that? Possible theory. Nothing. Pure chance. The world is made of chance. <laughs> that would mean that the physicists can't predict the future. It would mean that if you set up an experiment with exact conditions, you cannot predict what happens in the future because you can't predict whether it's going to go up or going to go down. You just got 4% odds. Your whole beautiful structure of science is reduced to computing odds. Nature, instead of being definite, does everything by chance. Not so good. Other possibilities, there are little spots on here. And all has to, the photon has to hit a spot on the surface. And Newton had several things. You'll find out later when I give you more phenomena, how these various explanations, which way it's going to go, and why the spot one doesn't work. But I'll give an argument that Newton made about that. He said it can't be that. Because, he said, you can polish glass. It's wonderful. I love to read these old guys. You know, they, they knew you could polish glass, but they had the intelligence to deduce from the fact that you can polish glass that there's no spots on it. Like, why? What's polishing? See, he polished it. He carved his own lenses. He ground his own lenses. So he knew what it was doing. He takes a coarse-grained sand-like stuff, uh, 
what do they call it, the, the, the polishing powder, I mean the grinding powder, and that shapes it, it cuts, but it cuts fairly obvious grooves. Then you take a finer one with finer particles and you cut the grooves are finer and you make the grooves finer and finer and finer. And after they're fine enough, suddenly it's smooth and the light comes right through. When it's coarse, it's bounced around. And so he concluded that light cannot see the grooves, that when I polish it, it's not that it's smooth, it's, it's still bumpy, but on a small scale, whereas when I have the big grains, it's on a big scale. It can't be any different. When I polish with the small grains, it's just a small scale irregularity. But that somehow, light doesn't see anything on a small scale. Correct. All experiments have shown that this is absolutely not the right explanation. If it was, there'd be all kinds of ways of testing that. I told you we can measure down to 10 to the minus 15 centimeters and so forth. And that what would happen would be you'd be able to find some area to focus very carefully the light so that the two that the reflection coefficient would be higher than 1 in 25 because you happen to be near a place where there was a spot. You can't do it. No matter what you do, it's 1 in 25. Other possibility, the light that's coming down here, the photons are doing, are, well, uh, like football. And they spin. And depending upon whether they hit with the nose point or with the flat point, depends on whether they bounce back. In other words, something inside the photon is determining which way it goes. Again, no. Because you can, if that were the case, the light that went through would be all of a certain kind of football. And if you try the reflection again, you'd expect a different number than 4% because of the fact that they're all lined up and you can't line light up. You can't fiddle around up here by any kind of filtering that'll change that percentage. All the light photons are identical if they're the same color, as in one color. They're all identical and they behave with 4%. Are we therefore reduced to this horror that Physics has got reduced, not to these wonderful predictions, <laughs> but to probabilities. Yes, we have. That's the situation today. In spite of the fact that philosophers have said it is a necessary requirement for science that uh, setting up an experiment exactly similar to will produce results exactly the same the second time. Not at all. One out of 25, it goes up and sometimes it goes down. Unpredictable, completely by chance. All right, I already see you turning off. I can see you say you don't understand me. You can't understand that it could be chance. I don't like it. Tough. <laughs> I don't like it either, but that's the way it is, okay? <laughs> I don't understand it either. I don't understand it. It must be that nature knows whether it's going to go up or down. No, it does not be that nature knows. We are not to tell nature what she's got to be. That's what we found out. Every time we take a guess as how she's got to be, and go and measure, she's clever. She's always got better imagination than we have, and she finds a cleverer way to do it than we have thought of. And in this particular case, the clever way to do it is by probability, by odds. And so the first aspect I have to tell you about then is that light works by probability. All right? By the way, just incidentally, the wave theory had no difficulty with this at all. Because what happened would be like the waves of the something are coming down here and they shake and they just keep going, but some of them will bounce back. Something like a sandbar sometimes partially reflects the waves in the sea. So some of the energy went back, but the waves don't operate this thing. By the way, when you turn the light on, this might go off at any moment. You don't have to wait for a certain length of time. Of course, there's odd that it goes off at any instant, but it could accidentally go off the moment you open the slit. So it's not a question of waiting for the energy of the wave to pile up or anything. It's hopeless. I have to start with light as particles. Waves explain many things, but it's not right. It's particles, okay? okay? It's photons. The problem is they have reflected with probability. Now, the next feature having to do with reflection again that I would like to describe is something that you're also familiar with, perhaps not so directly, but perhaps you've seen the colors in soap bubbles. It's made out of soap water, which has no color. No color, I've seen the colors. Mix it together, get a lot of soap water together, and look at it. No color. You take oil, which is a sort of a yellow fluid, you know, and you, it drips with blackish yellow junk. It drips out of an automobile on a rainy day. You must have experience here with that. And you look at the puddle to your delight, there are colors. Colors. These colors are produced by reflections from two surfaces near each other, very close together. If the surfaces are far apart, we'll discuss it later. The same phenomenon really occurs, but it's much harder to see under normal circumstances. 
What happens there is that in a soap bubble, for example, there's a layer of water. And so we have two surfaces at some distance from one another. So, and then the photon can either come down here and reflect right away, or it can come down this way and reflect from back there. Okay? Now, as it turns out, it's about the same percent. If it's just water between air and air, it's about the same 1 in 25 both times. What's the color? If I'm going to do it with monochromatic light, that light of one color, what can you see in colors? What you see on an oil film on a mud puddle or in a soap bubble when you use light of exactly one color is not colors but bands, bright and dark bands. Places where the light is reflected very well and places where it's not reflected at all across the bubble. Now, the different, the position of those bands, if you first looked at a bubble with red light, you see bands, black and, black and red, black and red, bands all over. If you look at it with blue light, you also see blue and white, blue and black, blue and black bands. But the pattern is not the same. They're displaced from the where the red ones were. And so when you have both red and blue, you get purple and red and black and purple and so on. Now, if you add to that yellow with its pattern and so forth, you get all these colors from mixing, okay? So we're going to simplify experimentally, as, I, as Newton did, and look at these, uh, this reflection. What Newton, uh, most of his experiments, he did this clever way. He had a beautiful curved piece of glass, which was a lens, and a flat piece, and put them next to each other. And then this was only a very slight curvature. And so he had this gap between the two. And when he shine, shone light this way and looked at reflected light, which, depending on where you looked, see, this is a cross-section of the lens, which is more completely like that. There is some reflection in here, which is irrelevant at the moment. There's another glass plate down here. When he looked in different places, the light came down all over. And when he looked in different places, he was looking at cases that corresponded to reflection with one gap or another gap between the side. And when he looked at this with monochromatic light, looked down on it, since it was a circular, a spherical lens, he saw in what I call bands in the soap bubble, but more organized, he saw rings, called Newton's rings, with a black area starting and then red, if it was red light he was using, and black, red, and so forth. These looked like they were coming closer and closer together, but he was a clever man and understood immediately what it meant. If he measured the distance from here to here and plotted the answer for whether it's red or dark against this distance, not against this, instead of measuring away from the center, he measured how far apart these plates were. Then he found, like our friends the Mayans, every time you have 365 points, they got black. In other words, if this was black and this was red, then double that distance was black again. And, yes and triple the distance was red, and four times the distance was black, and five times the distance was red, and so on, nice and even. In other words, instead of measuring by this distance, by measuring the thickness, you find the following experimental result. Reflection coefficient against thickness between the two layers. Okay? The spacing between, in this case, if it's an oil film bubble, with that, that's the distance. In this case, it's the spacing between the lens and the plate. And if you could change it, it's harder to change in a soap bubble under control, but it changes automatically as it dries out. You get the following. You get no reflection if the thickness is zero, then you get a strong reflection for a certain thickness, and then if you make it thick, you get no reflection, you get a thickness, a reflection, then you get no reflection, you get no reflection, and so on, so on, and on. And now it's getting thicker and thicker. Does this go on forever? Yep. <laughs> if you got good enough monochromatic light and get the experiment under control, you can make it go almost indefinitely. You can make this work for distances of a meter or more. Still catching, keeping track, whether it's even odd, even odd, bump, bump, bump. Okay? There's nothing that's interesting, very interesting. But you know, that's damning. Why? Because what theory were you figuring for the reflection from that that made the reflection be 4%? The odds, 4%, whatever. You put another layer down here at the right thickness, expecting to get 8%, and you get nothing. How does the layer down here 
turn off the reflection from the layer up here. Or, if you figure that out, and you make the layer just a little thicker, it doesn't turn it off, but in fact, the reflection is more than twice. On this scale here, this line would have been what you would have expected if you expected it always to be 4% plus 4% or 8% from the two surfaces. This is what you would have got if you disregarded all this nonsense that actually happened. By common sense, it reflects with a certain odds and it reflects from the other surface with a certain odds, and so altogether you get twice as many coming back. This is the twice as many. But for some, if the thickness is zero, you don't get anything. If the thickness, hey, that's not such a bad idea, is it? If you don't have any water there at all, you wouldn't get any reflection. Starts out right anyway. <laughs> so that theory was kind of dumb now that I come to think of it. And that helps to explain Newton's observation when the distance is too small, the light doesn't know anything about it. If the thickness is sufficiently small, it doesn't reflect. It does exactly the same as if there's nothing there. But the horror of it is, <laughs> it's all right that it increases as the thickness goes up, but it overshoots, you see. <laughs> and then it comes back to zero again when the thickness is just right. It's very difficult to invent a probability thing. If I had these spots on this surface, it's very hard to see how you're going to have spots on this surface, which turns the spots on that surface off when they're the right distance away. And so Newton went a little bit nutty. <laughs> and he talked about fits of reflection and transmission and so forth. And I would like to now just finish this by telling you what is the answer. Hmm? Now, here's the answer. This is the way we figure this out. It goes as follows. What we're going to calculate is a probability. The probability of a particular question. And then a probability that this counter goes off. The probability that if I had one photon coming down, it'll come back to this counter the probability, which is measured by this curve. And here's the way that the rule is for finding the probability. Now listen, hold your seats. Now hold on. Don't be afraid. Just, just go along, all right? Never mind it. Don't like it, huh? Just hold on. It works like this. What you do is you take a piece of paper. A piece of paper has nothing to do with the original thing. The piece of paper is only make marks on. It's got nothing to do with the lights. All right? <laughs> and it has your following rule. that you make an arrow to represent, well, for each reflection, you make an arrow. So this arrow, for example, is for the reflection from the front surface, and this arrow might be the reflection from the back surface. And I'll tell you in a minute how to make those arrows. And then what you do is you tie the arrows together this way. You make one and then the other. All right? That means you make this arrow, and then you put the tail of the other one on the head of that one, there's the first arrow is the reflecting arrow from the first surface. And this is the second arrow is the reflecting arrow for the second surface. And you put these two arrows together by this rule. And then look at where, how far off you've come to the end, yes? Yes, you count the pins in the hole. You count the number of beams you put in the barrel. I mean, you make these pictures. And then you ask, how big is the circle? An area. That area represents the probability that you get the thing back. If the circle area is big, then you get a high probability. If the circle area is small, you get a small probability. And I just have to say one more thing of how to make the arrows. Answer. Well, the size of the arrow depends upon the particular materials. I won't come into that right now. The absolute size, the 4%, is another matter. What you do is you make an arrow, and depending upon the time it takes, for the light to get from the source where it started to the place where you want to count it, you turn that out like a clock, depending on how much time. So if it takes a long time, you see, you start out at the source, there's the arrow for the source, but that's not, where you go, that's not the arrow you're going to draw. This is just a thinking arrow. And then you say, turn, turn, over the ding, 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 round, 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 depending on how much time it takes at a certain rate. Every second it goes around 75,000. It goes around a hell of a lot of times. <laughs> it goes around one followed by 15 zeros. Time in one second. But it doesn't take light very long to get to the, from the source to the source. It turns, but it still turns around a lot of times. 
you turn it around, okay? It's like the roulette wheel, and just at the moment it hits the counter, it happens to be sitting at some angle. All right? And that's for the reflecting from the first surface. Now, what about, that was, the, that was supposed to be this one. I, I've gotten too many arrows on here. What happened is you take the first surface reflection, turn it, through this angle, depending upon the time, and it ends up here. You say, that's not a very big angle. You said it was a big angle. It is a big angle. You know, if you keep on turning, it can look like a small angle when you're done, but you had to turn around and around and around and around, around right? You know what I mean. It, it goes around <laughs> like a clock hand after 25 years. It's still saying two can start at 2 and end up at 215. <laughs> That's 25 years. It went around. So here it is, having been turned around a lot of times. Okay, this is the, from the first surface, I should say. That's the one, the arrow for the first surface. Now the arrow for the second surface. Rule. Same as the arrow for the first surface, but in the other direction. It's just an accident. It happens to be the opposite direction it starts because, well, not because. The rule will turn out later. When you go from air to glass, it's one way from going glass to air. You change it around. Anyway, <laughs> you start this way for the second surface, and you turn this one. Brrr, no, which way did I turn? Yes. Brrr, brrr, for the time. And when you get finished with this roulette wheel and the second one, it comes out so. And then you add them together the way I said. You tie one on the other end and make the second. And that's the laws of elect light. And that'll tell you whether it reflects or it doesn't reflect. And what difference does it make? Why do I get these ups and downs? Well, sure, if you move this, kept that the same and move that, what is that going to do to my exercise over here? Answer. The first arrow, the time doesn't depend upon where the other surface is. Yet. So it does exactly as I did before. I'm doing the same experiment over with the bottom surface a little further along, OK? Top's the same place. Now the second one, however, when I went to turn it, it's a little bit further. It takes a little longer to get there, and therefore it's turned to a new position. So this second time, the picture would look, if the thing was thicker, the picture might look like this. Instead of being here, since it had to turn further, perhaps it turned to here the second time. And then when I add these two things together and tie one on the end of the other, and I'll just do that again here, you see that this line is now a long line, whereas before it was a relatively short line. This, remember, was the answer line. The answer line is a longer line, and the area here is much bigger of this circle, and the probability is larger. And this upping and downing, zing, 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 and the answer, this comes out exactly predictable just by this little game. All right? Now that's a shock, huh? That's, you say, yeah, he's going to explain why it's like that. That's exactly what I'm not going to explain. I don't understand it. <laughs> that's the way it works. The, what I'm going to do in the next lectures is to tell you sort of the generalization of this. Is this a special example for reflection? I'm going to tell you how the rules go about turning arrows. It's, in fact, somewhat simpler than this example. It's not bad at all. It's easy. It's not hard, but much more generally. And I'm going to, what I've done is this is a prototype of the general result. There is no secret behind it that we can do any better than give you that result. All I'm going to do is generalize it. It's going to sound something like this. This part you needn't understand right away. It's what I'm going to elucidate in the next lecture. The idea goes as follows, in general. It's just a statement, and I'll come back and do it again, so don't worry. To calculate the probability of an event, which can happen in a number of different ways, the probability of an event is always what we call the square of an amplitude. Walk in this model, it means the size of a circle corresponding to an arrow. An arrow is called an amplitude. For every event, you calculate an amplitude, which is an arrow on a plane. The probability is the area corresponding to that arrow. Right? That's the first thing. Second, how do we calculate the amplitude for an event? If the event is simply a particle going, a photon going from one point to another of a definite color, then it's simply an arrow which turns depending on the time. And that's the amplitude. Notice, by the way, if there's no reflections and no trouble, it just turns, the area stays the same, the probability of finding a photon is not altered. Okay, even though the arrow alters its area is the same. It's when we get in trouble. 
when we have more than one way to occur, then the rule goes as follows. If the thing can happen in more than one way, then you find the amplitude. What that was? The arrow? For each way. See, if it could happen in two ways, you got the arrow one way and the arrow the other way. And if it can happen three ways, if it was a double layer of stuff and so on, then you put another arrow for the third way. Maybe that one's a short one. And if there's a fourth way, you put another arrow. And when you're all finished, you put them tail to tail, all the possibilities, and find the total, what we call the total, or the net result of making all these little arrow steps. And that final arrow is a total amplitude, we say, for the event to occur. The probability is, as always, the area corresponding to that arrow. Well, that's kind of stinky, right? Well, it's fun, and it's strange that nature is like that. And I hope you come back to hear how it works in general, a little bit better statement of this to review it. And one other thing, I am going to try to explain to you how this rule explains several of the ordinary phenomena that you're used to in light, such as angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. On reflection, that light bends as it goes from air to water, and it travels in straight lines from point to point, and so on. It's all hidden in that one rule. And how that one rule carries all this information is part of the next lecture, as well as uh, I would tell you right away uh, one more thing, that this rule, that to figure out what happens in nature, you have to calculate an amplitude. is not just for light. It doesn't make any difference what happens. An electron does something. A nucleus explodes. It doesn't make any difference. How do you find it? You can only calculate the probability it's going to happen. And how do you do that? You can get you calculate an amplitude, that's a lousy little arrow. <laughs> and the probability is the square of the amplitude, we call it. That's really, the, we should call it in our case, the circle of the amplitude. The circle that represents the amplitude measures the probability. And that's true not just of light, but of the whole structure of nature as far as we can tell. And although quantum electrodynamics is only about electrons and light, we've discovered that part of the rule, at least, is valid also for nuclei, nuclear particles, quarks, and everything else. Uh, the thing that is special about electrodynamics is our complete knowledge of exactly what the rules are for drawing the arrows. But the fact that you have to draw arrows and end up calculating probabilities like that, which is such a shocking and horrible form for nature, is something that I will talk about next time in further detail. Thank you very much. These rotating arrows are all very well, but is there another model? The question is, is there another model? Naturally, we struggle to find it. I'll tell you the answer to what's going to be in the fourth lecture. Nobody can find one. It's worse. A, we're not so dumb. As to, you know, we're pretty advanced compared to the Mayans. We've analyzed it very carefully. We almost prove it's impossible to find one over a wide class of ordinary possibilities. If it's going to be any kind of a model, it's going to be at least as weird as this thing. The reason is that the answers from this are so simple. That is, it looks a little complicated, you're not used to it. But mathematically, those forms and those curves are mathematically so simple, and the rules are so simple, it's hard to make any mechanism at all that can reproduce such simplicity. The Mayan thing was really fairly complicated. The numbers were peculiar. There's no explanation of them. This Analogy, our numbers are not peculiar. Those, they have an explanation for it. It's a different situation. One more thing about gravity, I would just remind you, we don't really have a good model because what comes to, why is it that there's a force inversely as the square of the distance? And what do you mean inversely as the square of the distance? That's mathematical. And Newton was the one who taught us that we can make progress if you stop arguing about that. He said, I make no hypotheses. I don't explain the gravity law. I tell you what the law is, that tells you how the things look, and you can predict where the stars are going to be, and that's the pattern, but I don't, at the moment, know. But he left open the question, just like you asked, maybe tomorrow somebody will figure it out. On your particular question, it's always possible that tomorrow somebody will figure it out, but it's going to be very difficult and very strange. Do you like the idea that our picture of the world has to be based on a calculation which involves probability? I, not really. If I get right down to it, I don't say I like it, I don't say I don't like it. I am very highly trained over the years to be a scientist, to 
and that's a certain way you have to look at things. When I give a talk, I simplify it a little bit, uh, I cheat a little bit to make it sound like I don't like it. What I mean is it's peculiar. But uh, I never think this is what I like, this is what I don't like. I think this is what it is and this is what it isn't, okay? And whether I like it or I don't like it is really irrelevant. And believe it or not, I have extracted it out of my mind. I do not even ask myself whether I like it or I don't like it because it's a complete irrelevancy. It's a kind of a dumb answer, but it's true. And when I'm lecturing, I shouldn't have said I don't like it. What I was trying to say is you probably don't like it. There's nothing I think we can do about it. It might have been something else. I, I don't know how else to express it. It's not really personally a dislike. Have you left out anything in this lecture which you need to add later? It, it's a very difficult, and I worked very hard on the lecture to try to use as my examples things that I didn't have to change later, the interpretation slightly. You know, I couldn't get an elementary enough process that I didn't have. Later on, I have to make a little change. You see, we talk and we see as though it's reflected at the surface. Actually, What's really happening, and with a deeper understanding, which I should do later on in the lecture, but I might forget, is that it's reflected by cause. It affects electrons in here, which re-emit light here, or here, or here, or here, or here, or here. And what really is the things that we have to add is not the arrow from here and the arrow from here, but a whole lot of little ones from all the distances from there to there. But believe it or not, you get the same answer. Okay. So what I really ought to do, and I would do if I were doing it correctly, would be to talk about the reflections from every interior part and adding arrows. But I would rather add just two arrows the first time than an infinity of them. So I cheat, didn't cheat a little bit, but I got myself in a slight hole which you picked up. The actual reflection is from the material, the, the electrons in the material. In the case of Newton's thing, it's because the electrons which are reflecting from the glass here and here are interrupted in their pattern. And when you add the arrows, it comes out to be, believe it or not, the same as if you just take the one, the one from here and one from there. Uh, perhaps just for those who can, I don't want to make it too hard, but just to give you a clue of the marvelous way it works. If you added tiny arrows to represent reflections from everywhere, instead of just talking about it reflected from here to here, which is a good equivalent way. But if you took a whole lot of little baby arrows, each one a very, very tiny angle from the other, all the same length, which is the reflections from all these places, you see, you generate a circle. And what I was using instead of the circle were the two arrows, which were the beginning arrow and the end arrow of the circle. And what you told me is I shouldn't talk about the reflection on the front surface and the reflection on the back surface. I should talk about the reflection of all the stuff in between, and it's, but it's equivalent. The net result of going around here is the same as going up here and back on that one. It even accounts for the minus sign. That is, the distance from here to here is what you get by putting onto this arrow this one backwards. Well, I got a, the whole, the distance is the same, see? So I get, I got it upside down. But uh, this line is the same line as you would get by going in a circle. So it's really reflected from the interior. But in the first lecture, I thought I'd just get two arrows instead of an infinite. Does your picture apply to anything besides electrons and light? This aspect is universal over the whole of the world's phenomena, as far as we can tell, not just a light and electricity. This phenomenon of drawing arrows and making areas for probabilities. The probability amplitudes, we call them. The amplitude and the probabilities are the squares of these amplitudes or the circles of them. That's universal. The next problem is a rule for how to draw arrows under different circumstances. What kind of arrows do you draw under different circumstances? What are the rules? One of the rules I told you is it turns at a certain rate for light and so on. Uh, those are the rules that we do not know well in the case of the nuclear phenomena. But we know ex virtually exactly, or at least as far as we can tell experimentally. I lost my numbers. Uh, for electrons and light, the rule for how to make the arrows is completely apparently completely known, and nothing is ever complete. But within the accuracy and the so on, it's known. What's not known is how the rules for making the arrows when it's protons that are moving around and so on, okay? When you are looking at something, do you see only light, or do you see the object? 
The, the, the question of whether or not when you see something, you see only the light or you see the thing you're looking at is one of those dopey philosophical things <laughs> that an ordinary person has no difficulty with. Even the most profound philosopher in sitting eating his dinner has many difficulties in making out that what he looks at perhaps might be only the light from the steak but it still implies the existence of the steak, which he's able to lift by the fork to his mouth. The philosophers that were unable to make that analysis and that idea have uh, fallen by the wayside to hunger. <laughs> Can you tell us whether in the future your theory will be found to be wrong, or is it complete? No, of course not. How can we know what the final thing is? I tell you only what we know today. Can I tell you more? Do you want me to tell you more? Would you like me to tell you what we know tomorrow? <laughs> I'm sorry. I have the Nobel Prize from the past, not from the future. I do not know the future. And I answer in a similar way to your likes and dislikes. If you ask me what I think will happen in the future, I'll tell you I do not think. I do my best to understand what I'm under supposed to understand, what we know so far. I do not know what you're going to discover next, okay? I can't. I know only it's... You're talking about the edge of the discovery business. And it's impossible to say what's beyond the edge. So I can't answer that, all right? Except to say that the history of physics has been that the things that looked like they were nicely set aside were, and it turned out to be erroneous upon further discovery. And since society has continues to be vigorous enough in its endeavors to investigate nature, it's almost sure, from a social point of view, not from a theory of physics, <laughs> that new things will be found out which will not fit in, and uh, we have no way to tell whether some young man, perhaps from New Zealand or somewhere, will find another way or more about this stuff, so it'll have a different picture in the future. Obviously, I can't say. I tell you what it looks like today. You call it my theory. It's not my theory. It's the theory everybody uses. 